I'm very happy to now be on to our um, third um, uh, ESOCI Migration Research Network uh, seminar. Uh, for those of you who've been able to come to the to the previous seminars, uh, we've had uh, Alan Gamlin from Adelaide and uh, Jay Marlowe from here in Auckland uh, give some really interesting seminars. I'm particularly pleased that, that Kate has agreed to um, give a talk um, today um, so that we can continue on uh, the conversation that we've started around migration issues and continue it on in a, in, in a way that addresses, I think, some of the diversity and breadth um, in migration research uh, in New Zealand. And so, um, so Kate, as many of you will know, is, uh, is based in uh, the School of History, Philosophy and Political Science and International Relations at Victoria University and focuses on comparative politics. Um, her research, I think, has been a really important in particular for thinking about issues of citizenship in relation to migration as well as citizenship more broadly uh, within New Zealand. And it's exactly on that topic that, uh, that she's going to speak to us today, uh, thinking about immigration and electoral politics. Um, and I think the most recent election has drawn attention to some very interesting connections that her talk uh, promises to um, uh, illuminate a little bit further as, as we continue on. Um, so I will um, pass on to you, Kate, um, if you're ready. Do you have a um, PowerPoint that you are able I do, to? Yeah. Before it's all ready to go. I'll just click on the share screen there. Okay. Show. 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 Yeah, great. Okay, Q. Uh, yes, we can Yeah. Uh, I'd like to start just by thanking um, Jessica and you, Francis, again for setting up this um, network, which I think is a really wonderful way of connecting with people who, a lot of whom I haven't met before. Um, and I really look forward to all of the debates that we can keep going forward with um, as a result of this network. Uh, so, and also to thank you for inviting me to come and speak to the network. I'm going to talk about some pretty uh, recent research. Um, it's a new research project uh, that's really bringing together a whole lot of strands of work that um, I've done in the past. And uh, Fiona Barker, my colleague here at Victoria and I are going to work together on a book length project looking specifically at uh, the electoral politics of immigration in New Zealand. So what I want to talk about today is just really some of the um, parts of that wider project. And um, it's, as I said, it's very early days in this particular project. So some of what I'm going to do is just lay out the main questions that I'm going to be interested in asking, and then show a little bit of preliminary, um, of preliminary findings from what I've done so far on the project. So just to start off with why the electoral politics of immigration, um, it's a huge topic in many other liberal democracies, how immigration affects politics and how electoral politics affect immigration, but it's not something that's been looked at in great detail to date in New Zealand. And that's primarily because um, political scientists in New Zealand um, haven't tended to be migration specialists. There aren't many of us who do that. And so the people who've tended to look at um, electoral politics have either not been that interested in immigration or it's quite a recent phenomenon that it's had the kinds of impacts that it's having now, or they've been frustrated by the very small um, sample sizes available in the data. Are you guys able to see the slides okay? Yep. In Auckland? Yep. Um, and the other thing is that um, many New Zealand migration scholars um, haven't been interested, particularly interested, or haven't been electoral scholars themselves. And so it's that sort of um, dual reason that I think there's a, a, a important gap in the literature at the moment in that area. Um, and if we think about immigration and electoral politics and the relationship between the two of them, it's sort of a two-way relationship in that um, immigration has been shown to have many impacts on things like um, party positioning, party policies, party framing, uh, and on uh, levels of electoral support for particular types of parties. But similarly, uh, electoral politics itself has had a very significant impact on how immigration itself is framed. And of course, its elections are the point at which uh, parties can change 
uh, and lead to different kinds of immigration policies. But also the kinds of framing that immigration debates take on during election periods can set the tone of the debate uh, for many years to come and can be very influential in the way that migrants themselves feel included or not included in the host society. Um, and it also impacts, of course, on ethnic minorities who may not be immigrants at all, but who are nonetheless uh, affected by the way in which immigration is debated. So for both of those reasons, um, I think it's an important topic and it's a two-way kind of relationship between electoral politics and immigration. So I'm just going to very quickly go through some of the main uh, things that have been studied in the, in the international literature looking at electoral politics and immigration. Um, one is a focus on identifying and explaining immigrant voting behaviour. So that is to say, how significant is the immigrant to vote in terms of determining electoral outcomes? Um, what kind of factors determine whether immigrants decide to vote and whether they vote for particular parties, demonstrate particular partisanship or not? Um, a second major focus in the literature is identifying immigration's role in party behaviour. So in other words, how do parties themselves respond when immigration becomes a salient issue during election period time, periods? And then thirdly, um, it asks how um, the issue of immigration affects voter behaviour beyond immigrant voting, but uh, voting amongst non-immigrants and what kind of factors explain that. So I'll just go quickly through some of the main questions that have been raised. Uh, and these are some of the things that I'll talk about in relation to New Zealand and as far as we have data on them to date. So first of all, are immigrants electorally significant? Um, and in answering this, scholars have looked at what are the total numbers of immigrants, uh, what is the, the kind of electoral system and the franchise rules and how do these work to either facilitate or inhibit the participation of immigrants in elections? Um, what's the spatial concentration of immigrants? So are they, for example, spread quite widely throughout a country and then the type of electoral system that you have becomes very important or is there, uh, are their numbers concentrated in particular electorates? And again, that affects the degree of uh, uh, electoral power that they're able to exert. And then of course all of that only really becomes significant if immigrants display different types of voting behaviour to non-immigrants. If they are more or less, you know, if their voting behaviour is determined by the same factors as uh, exist for non-immigrants then it doesn't really make a difference. So we ask questions, or the questions are asked about whether immigrants turn out more or less than non-immigrants, whether they display specific partisanship. So do immigrants, for example, from particular home countries display different partisan preferences to others and to the majority group? So those are some of the questions on that issue. Um, and then the third part of this first question to do with um, immigrant voter behaviour seeks to explain voter behaviour amongst immigrants. So what factors influence them? Um, a major theory is that the political socialisation in the country that immigrants have come from affects them. And one of the major um, hypotheses here is that immigrants who come from non-democratic countries are much less likely to integrate politically because they haven't had the experience of growing up in a democratic state. Uh, other hypotheses uh, say that there, are, there may be religious, cultural, ethnic, types of behaviour that concentrate in particular immigrant groups uh, and that these dominate uh, or at least affect electoral behaviour in a way that isn't necessarily related to the, their political socialisation in their home country. Other people have drawn attention to the importance of institutional factors, for example, how easy is it to become a citizen in that country, because that, of course, if, it's very, if the citizenship requirements are very tough, then that's going to decrease immigrants' ability to gain citizenship, and therefore, in most countries, the right to vote. Similarly, um, does the electoral system uh, lend itself to parties attempting to reach out to immigrants, because 
outreach from parties itself was seen as really important in terms of determining whether or not migrants vote. So those kind of institutional factors are important. important. Also seen as really important is the length of residence. So uh, some data has shown that whilst immigrants don't vote when they're first in a country, the first few years, even up to 10 years after that period of time, they may be very likely to vote. And so length of residence is thought to be pretty important. Other scholars, and particularly scholars in Canada, um, have looked at things like what happens to immigrants after they arrive, and they say this, these earlier factors may not be nearly as important as the experiences of the immigrants once they reach a country, uh, and things like whether they have uh, experienced discrimination in the country of settlement, um, and whether they feel as though they belong in that country can have a really major impact on uh, whether they choose to participate in the electoral system. And then another factor that's uh, quite interesting, and it's probably something that my colleague Aicha knows quite a lot about because her area is diaspora politics, is the home country influence on the electoral behaviour of um, diaspora groups. And so I think in the New Zealand case, we are seeing some of that, um, and I won't have time to talk about it much, but in terms of the uh, Chinese media in New Zealand has become very dominated from what I can tell so far by, uh, or they've been bought out by companies that are dominated by mainland China. And then it seems to be influencing the kind of reportage about uh, politics in New Zealand that, that uh, members of Chinese communities are getting. So anyway, that's, a, that's a, another um, potential influence on how and whether voters, immigrants vote. And finally, uh, there's some research that shows that voters, immigrants may be likely to develop a loyalty towards the party that is in power at the time of their arrival, because that's the party that has facilitated their arrival in the country. And they may associate that party with their ability to migrate to that country. Uh, so moving on to some, uh, looking at some of the uh, effects of immigration on party politics, some of the main um, kinds of questions that have been asked in the international literature are how parties themselves, political parties, have responded to changing demographics as a result of immigration and looked at the attempts by parties to balance an outreach to growingly significant uh, immigrant voters with uh, continuing an outreach to their traditional party base and how do they manage that balancing act. Uh, some have responded by placing particular attention on recruiting candidates and selecting candidates that are representative of particular communities that are seen to be uh, increasingly significant in terms of their electoral power. And then uh, they've also responded by targeting their messages, and that's where the, uh, the ethnic minority media has become very important. What kind of messages are going out in that media? Uh, and to what extent are they targeting messages specifically at those um, ethnic minorities? Another important issue, and this has of course become very important in Europe, where there's been the rise of far-right populist parties, that's been a huge emphasis in the political science literature is what has, um, what has caused the rise of those parties and how have the other parties responded. And sort of preceding those questions is the question of why and when does immigration actually rise to the top of all of the different issues that can be important during an election campaign. And there are various explanations again, one is that it's to do with demand side factors, that is that it's in response to uh, voters themselves and to public opinion and that, that, that people are responding to perhaps a sudden noticeable increase in the number of immigrants in society and, and that's leading to an electoral demand for some kind of policy response to that. Others have emphasised that uh, frequently the demand side didn't exist prior to, uh, or at least not in such um, great numbers, prior to party supply side factors, that is deliberate priming by parties. Parties see a gap in the electoral spectrum for a party that might, uh, for, for policies and messaging that might uh, stimulate that fear of the other, etc. And so they provide that. And so that's a, a supply side uh, kind of explanation. And then on top of that, you have the role of the electoral system, because the electoral system itself, of course, 
um, either facilitates supply side or demand side type uh, explanations. And then one factor which I haven't read a lot about but I suspect will become much more important is this question of international contagion as we see the rise of populist anti-immigrant parties internationally all of the other party countries are starting to look and see is this phenomenon going to happen here and certainly that's we saw that in the framing in the New Zealand media you know New Zealand first and then you know is he a populist leader well, of course he's populist is he is he in the same family as some of those leaders and then we see it in the international leader calling even Jacinda uh, Ardern uh, is she a Trump-like populist because she wants to reduce immigration? So that sort of international contagion can actually raise the salience of an issue. Um, and then some of the important questions that arise from that is what impact populist anti-immigration parties have had on the other mainstream parties. So have they had the effect of shifting uh, the centre-right party to the right because they see perhaps some of the votes that, that, that their supporters might otherwise have got being taken, so has it shifted those centre-right parties rightwards? Or have, ha, has anti-immigrant politics as practised by minority and minority populist anti-immigrant party shifted the whole spectrum to the right? <clears throat> so that it's something to which all parties need to respond because it's now being framed differently. And then uh, we have people like Tim Bale, for example, who's used a Downsian analysis of the party spectrum to identify uh, four main responses by the mainstream parties. One is to try and decrease the salience of immigration during election campaigns, and that is by framing uh, the important issues in the election campaign as being quite different things. So not immigration isn't an issue, so they try not to talk about it, they talk about other things. So that's sort of the deflect strategy. Another strategy is to talk about immigration so that it doesn't leave that space only open to the populist minority parties, but to reframe it in a way so that it's it's not about the kinds of things that the populist min, you know, right wing party talks about, but it's some other kind of issue. Another response is to totally reject it, to call out anti-immigrant, anti-immigration, exclusionary kind of language and say that's what's happening here, we're not having a bar of it, that's what you're doing, that's not the kind of people we want to be. And then the fourth option is to adopt it themselves and so to try and take in some of the appeal that was previously um, going only to the minor party by adopting some of that minor party strategies. So in terms of um, laying all this out in terms of the kinds of questions that I want uh, to talk about in relation to New Zealand politics. So I'm interested in, for example, how have the New Zealand political parties responded? Have they, which of these strategies have they adopted? And then lastly, and I won't be talking about this today because I haven't got time, um, but it's, it's important because I think it's the flow on effect from those other things, like what is, how the parties themselves have framed immigration will affect the extent to which um, voters themselves see immigration as a salient issue. So another focus in the international literature is asking what, under what conditions immigration has become a salient issue for voters. Um, and some explanations are to do with the amount of migration, so the argument there is that if there's a lot of migration then we're likely to see it become more salient. But again, it may not be so much to do with the reality as to do with how the parties have uh, presented it and whether they're, whether they're primed um, voters to see immigration as a salient issue. And then there may be other factors such as unemployment, economy specific events etc. And then this all leads into the final question about what explains the rise internationally in support for anti-immigrant populist parties. And the three main hypotheses here are that people vote for an anti-immigrant party or an anti-immigration party, and I do distinguish between those two, when they see immigration and immigrants as a threat, particularly as a cultural threat. Um, but others have said, uh, actually, it's much more likely that you'll see a rise in anti-immigration voting amongst those parts of the population which haven't experienced high levels of immigration as that and so the contact hypothesis says that whilst you might have an initial period of reaction against high levels of immigration, after a period of time, people 
accept diversity, they understand diversity, and it becomes less frightening to them. And so the contact hypothesis says that um, you'll see high right, a rise in support for anti-immigrant populist parties amongst those who don't actually have high levels of contact but fear that they might in the future. But surveys of the political science literature looking at these two hypotheses have tended to find <laughs> If you, if you look at a meta survey of it, there's support for both and there's no conclusive evidence one way or the other. There's many ones that argue that it's a cultural threat, others that argue that it's a contact. And so a final hypothesis is that, that really the most important thing is how it is all framed and so how people perceive immigration. Do they perceive it as a, as a cultural threat and, and the extent to which that comes to them through both the party framing and the, and the um, media framing? So that's kind of the international literature part of it and the questions of this part of the research. So now I just want to turn to um, what we know about immigration, immigration's effect on the electoral demography in New Zealand and then what we also know about to date about its effects on um, voting behaviour and turnout. So first of all, I think one of the interesting things about the New Zealand context is how favourable it is towards uh, immigrant voting. Uh, and that's because MMP gives strength both to spatially concentrated migra migrant group, immigrant groups and to spatially dispersed ones because you have the party vote and you have the electorate vote. Um, factors like uh, it's very easy to enrol. Um, Hang on, that's this one here. Very easy to enrol in New Zealand, and so it's um, the barriers to enrolling, I think, are pretty low in New Zealand. And uh, one of the most significant differences to other countries, of course, is that uh, people who are not citizens can vote in New Zealand. They just need to be on a non temporary form of visa. And so that increases the proportion of the immigrant population who are able to participate in electoral politics. And there are institutional um, things that also make it more likely that they will be enrolled. And that is, uh, there's quite a high level of interaction between the immigration uh, service and the electoral uh, commission, where they sh share information because it's compulsory for anyone who's eligible to vote to be on the roll. And so the um, immigration service is providing information to the Electoral Commission to try and help them ensure that immigrants get enrolled on the electoral roll and fulfil that part of um, their responsibility as uh, residents in New Zealand. Um, early voting, again this is another way in which it facilitates migrant participation and New Zealand has uh, comparatively liberal laws on uh, voting from abroad. Not only can citizens vote from abroad if they return home every three years, but permanent residents can also vote from abroad if they return to New Zealand every year. And New Zealand has a wide variety of ways in which you can vote. So there's, um, I, I can't remember what they all are now, but there are, if you compare it internationally, we have many ways in which you are able to submit a vote internationally. So anyway, all of those things I think make turn out that institutional factors are pretty favourable for immigrant voting in New Zealand. So if we look at the uh, change in demography, now ethnic population projections, I know, are a projection of ethnic populations, not of immigrant populations, so we need to bear that in mind. But um, for some of the groups, particularly Asian groups, a lot of the growth that we see will be from immigration. Uh, and we can see that uh, these are projections that were based on the uh, most recent census results, so they're probably pretty out of date by now, given the high levels of migration that we've had in the last few years. But we see that um, Asian, and again, I know I'm fully aware that it's a very diverse group of people with uh, subgroups that are likely to have quite different um, voting profiles. But nonetheless, 21% of the population by 2038 projected to be Asian, 11% um, Pacifica, Māori, 20%. So the Pacifica group, from what I can see, uh, are more likely to be um, growing as a result of natural increase rather than immigration. But nonetheless, we see 
the electoral significance of these groups really growing over the next few years. Uh, and political parties, no doubt, will be aware of that and thinking about how to position themselves in relation to that. Um, we can already see that in terms of spatial concentration, there's um, a, quite a large number of electorates that have more than 30% of the population in those electorates were born overseas. Um, almost all of these electorates are in Auckland, except for this one, where we sit right now. <laughs> uh, and some of them are very high, like botany, 50% uh, of the electorate born overseas, and some of the others also getting pretty high up there. And then there's another 12, which, are, uh, which I don't have listed here, but which also have a much higher proportion uh, of overseas born than is the case for the total New Zealand population. And then if we break these down, um, and I have to say, this, the figures are not completely accurate here. I've taken all of this data from the uh, electorate profiles on the parliamentary website, and they are a little bit, um, yeah, they're a bit inaccurate because some people apparently didn't seem to report whether they were born overseas or not. But for some reason, the figures are not quite um, adding up to 100. And of course, with the other ones, they add up more because of multiple, yeah, multiple reporting people of multiple ethnicities. But nonetheless, we can see here that some of these um, electorates are diverse in multiple ways, like botany, for example, where almost 40% of the population, and this was based on the, the previous census, and I think we'll, we'll see a lot of change in a couple of years when we see the new census, um, has very high levels of um, migrants from all over the world. Um, not just Asia, but also from the Pacific Islands. And if we add in the quite small proportions, but still growing proportions of those in the very large Middle Eastern, Latin American and African category, these are also where those populations are concentrated. So we can see, um, yeah, quite a lot of electorates that have high levels of migration, or of immigrants in them from diverse places. But, and I, I haven't done any real quantitative analysis on this, but hope to. Um, one of the trends we see, these blue are the stars as the party vote in 2017. The, in, the, the, in the electorates that went national, they tend to be the electorates where there is a high proportion of um, Asian, uh, and with the exception of botany, uh, a lower proportion of Pacific Island people, understandably. But interestingly, I think in some of the electorates like Mount Roskill, which is an incredibly diverse electorate, it has a very high proportion of Asian um, people living in it, not all of whom are going to be immigrants, of course, uh, but also a very high level of Pacific Island people. And so that tends to be the trend here, that where you see uh, these electorates going to labour, it's where there's a combination of uh, Pacific Island and Asian, uh, whereas the other ones where there's a high level of um, Asian Asian voters and have gone national, there's not so many Pacific Island voters. In any case, this is an area that I think deserves a lot more analysis, um, and some people have done some work on this, which I'll come to in a, while, in a minute. Um, sorry. Um, one thing I looked at was the increase between 2005 and 2015 and in, in some of those electorates with very high Pacifica populations the level of increase is actually quite low for most of them with the exception of these ones because the red the red bars represent uh, levels of population increase since 2005 so we can see in Kelston and Manarewa, uh, Manukau East there's quite high increase in the um, percentage of the population in that electorate that is Pacifica, but in many other electorates there's uh, very little increase at all. Um, if we compare that with the Asian constituents, um, we can see that very high levels of um, increase between 2005 and 2015. The reason why I point that out is because, as we'll see in a minute, um, a lot of immigrants, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that people don't vote when they first come into a country. It takes them several elections to become settled into the country and enough to want to vote. 
And so when you see electorates with very high levels of reasonably recent immigration, I think we can assume that we haven't yet felt the impact, the electoral impact of this uh, immigration. And these voters may, many of them may not yet have come on stream, as you might, might say. So just to summarise this part, are immigrants electorally significant in New Zealand? I think, yes, undoubtedly they are. That the institutional conditions are particularly favourable favorable for them. That numerically Asian immigrants are going to become a stronger force as their length of residence increases. And I think parties will, will see increasingly them uh, increasing their outreach to those Asian groups. And the new census is likely to uh, reveal significant growth in the Asian population. So, so a lot of, we'll see a lot of change in those electorates. Um, how am I going for time? Do immigrants in New Zealand vote? As I said, all of that is really uh, not that relevant unless uh, immigrants both turn out and display significantly different voting patterns to uh, the non-immigrant population. Now, unfortunately in New Zealand we've had very little data with which to test any of these questions. Um, and that's partly because it's, it's, there's been a lot of difficulty in getting data that distinguishes between overseas and New Zealand born voters and identifies the birthplace of immigrant voters. Because when you want, what you want to find out is where are they born, how long have they been in New Zealand, which country did they come from? Um, and when you break it down to those levels, the sample size has become so small that it's not been possible to do much um, really robust analysis on it. Um, and as a result, a lot of researchers have used ethnic voting data as a proxy, um, but that doesn't distinguish between overseas born and, and New Zealand born, and so it's, and often it's too small when it does. So it has the effect of taking the immigrant status out of the relationship and it also, because those uh, categories are so large, Asian covering such a large part of the world, it disguises a lot of intra-ethnic um, differences and a lot of differences between people from different source countries. So it's been really difficult to work out what the effects of immigrant status, ethnicity, country of birth and length of residence is. Um, but nonetheless, some of the data that we have, hey, Francis, am I, how long did you want me to talk for? Oh, you, okay. No sound. I, was, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to talk for like... Uh, yep, yep. Uh, you're at 30, we're at 35 past, so maybe another five or 10 minutes with that suit. Yep, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so just very, I'm just very briefly going to go through some stats that are not, I don't think, entirely, they're not unreliable, but I don't, I think we need to do a lot more to, to work out what's going on. Um, some of the stats that we have from the, um, on turnout come from the General Social Survey that was done in 2012. And this is often cited as showing that Asian uh, people in New Zealand had the lowest turnout of any ethnic grouping, like broad ethnic grouping. This is data from 2008, 2011 and 2014. Um, the New Zealand um, <coughs> election study also shows that Asian voters or Asian people have amongst the lowest, but not as low in some cases as Māori or in other cases as Pacific Island people. But as I said, they, that, you know, that, I think we need to do a lot more work on this because um, the sample sizes are quite small and the data is not entirely consistent. Some of the, I've done some work on the um, turnout. This is the General Social Survey 2012 that looks at turnout amongst recent migrants by ethnicity and it shows indeed that uh, Asian immigrants, recent being five years or less, had a, a lower turnout than European or Pacific. But what's interesting here is that Pacific have a pretty high turnout. Uh, and Europe, European quite a low turnout. Um, another way to cut this is to ask what is the turnout amongst those who are born in New Zealand? So here we can distinguish between, um, though we can take out of the equation socialisation in the home country because these are people who've been socialised in the New Zealand uh, political environment. And here we do see that um, amongst 
New Zealand born by ethnicity, Asian uh, New Zealanders have the lowest turnout, which I think is a very interesting find out, finding. But again, uh, we need to do more research on this. Uh, and then one of the other findings that the, that is often being talked about in relation to the uh, to the general social survey is their finding that immigrants, after they've been here for a long period of time, actually have a higher turnout than New Zealand born. And so immigrant status in and of itself is not a determinant of whether people turn out or not. Uh, it may be that over a period of time, immigrants become be better uh, participants in the electoral process than New Zealand born. Um, but nonetheless, we do still see this trend where Asian uh, immigrants are voting at lower levels than other immigrants. Uh, and just lastly, in this set of slides, this is one that does seem to show that that sense of belonging does have an impact on whether or not people participate in politics. Um, and we see this whether people are born in New Zealand or not. So this is really t speaking to the idea that uh, voting is not just about understanding the electoral system, it's about feeling part of the electoral system and feeling part of the society in which you are living. And so we see even amongst New Zealand born a much lower level of um, turnout amongst those who feel a low sense of belonging. Um, Recent migrants, I mean, I think this is pretty understandable that those who are recent don't participate, but those who are really feeling alienated don't turn out in very high numbers at all. So uh, just uh, Fiona Barker, my colleague and I did some, frustrated by the inability of the quantitative data to be able to tell us very much about why any of this might be, we did a series of focus groups amongst immigrants from different Asian source countries and we found that contrary to the argument of political socialization that people from non-democratic countries, which of course includes China, um, we found high levels of political interest uh, amongst people from all different backgrounds, regardless of whether the countries were democratic or not. Almost all of the ones people we spoke to, and we spoke to people from uh, China, India, Cambodia, Korea, um, yeah, I think those groups. And we found amongst all of them a strong sense of voting as a duty, that, that, that was something that they needed to do when they came here. High levels of trust in the New Zealand political system and that they found very low barriers to uh, voting in terms of institutions. Uh, and as I said, only limited evidence that political socialisation in non-democratic countries decreases voting intention. And we found that that the time of arrival seemed to have a significant impact on partisan preferences. So for example, we interviewed um, uh, some, we, we split our groups up into some who were recent immigrants, some who'd come as business migrants, some who had been here for a long period of time. And we found, for example, with uh, some of the Indian migrants who'd been here for a long time, they came here post, um, post partition India, and at the time of a Labour government, and they expressed very strong loyalty to, to Labour for some of the laws that Labour had implemented during the time when they came. Um, similarly with the Cambodians who we spoke who came as refugees, they came during a period of um, Labour government and they had this enormous sense of loyalty to the government that had let them in. So it's again something that's uh, worth exploring. So basically, Oh, sorry, now I'm looking quickly at how they vote and, um, like in other words, do they have a preference for a particular party? And of course, new, up until pretty recently, the vast majority of New Zealand migrants were British, but I've never seen any empirical research on British immigrant voters. I'd love to know about that if there is some. Uh, and I think that's because the assumption is that British immigrant voters would demonstrate the same kinds of electoral behaviours as uh, non-immigrant New Zealanders. But that's something, that, again, that I think would be interesting to look at now, given the types of uh, immigrants that are coming in from Britain. Um, uh, uh, Leon Usatini, a lot of you might be familiar with his work on uh, Pacifica voters. His master's thesis did a survey of um, the news based on the New Zealand election study and he found very strong links between uh, Pacifica voters and Labour and yeah something that's probably not a surprise to many of us but very good empirical data to, to explain that. In terms of the partisanship of uh, Asian voters I think it's 
much less well explored. There was a, a poll that came out earlier this year that some of you might have seen uh, that the World TV Trace that found 74% of Chinese voted national and 14% for Labour if, if, if they had been asked what they were going to vote for the next day. Um, and there has been other research done, including that by Xi Jong Park, who looked at Koreans and Chinese voters. She found, uh, in fact, in her survey, which was a random sample of a thousand Korean and Chinese voters, 51% said, and this is back in 2002, that they voted for Labour for their party vote, uh, and 35% for National. Um, but in the electorate vote, more had voted for National than Labour. And so again, I think this possibly indicates effects of incumbency, um, but also speaks to the differences that she found between the different uh, source countries of some of the uh, Asian voters that she looked at. But I think this is an area that's really not explored. And so we, we've, uh, in the, the 2017 New Zealand election survey, uh, we, we have tried to, get a much larger sample size of Asian and Pacifica and we're hoping that that will give us the ability to do some of this more statistical quantitative research. So just uh, very quickly to respond to the second part of what I was asking that is how have the parties themselves responded to um, this, these demographic changes and how, have the, how did they position themselves in relation to immigration during the election campaign. And of course, given the timing, this is very recent research, but I have done a little bit of um, content analysis, which I'll share with you quickly. But um, in terms of outreach, this is the kind of research that Fiona is doing. And in, in our book, um, she will be focusing on some of these things. She's been looking at the establishment of uh, particular people within the parties who are responsible for their ethnic uh, um, minority outreach um, the, for the success or otherwise of their recruitment and selection of ethnic minority candidates and also those candidates feelings themselves about whether they represent the party or represent these particular immigrant and ethnic communities. And then another project that Fiona and I have got on at the moment is we've collected um, minority language and immigrant targeted media and we're doing content analysis on a bunch of Chinese newspapers and websites, Indian newspapers and websites and Korean and Filipino. Uh, so we're going to look to see about how the parties are using those media to outreach to immigrants and how how the parties themselves are covered in that media. But just um, this is the last part of the slideshow. How did the parties talk about immigration during the election campaign? Um, how did they position themselves in relation to New Zealand First, which comes to any election now with a long tail of anti-immigration uh, framing and in some cases quite explicit anti-immigrant framing. So how did the parties position themselves in relation to that kind of framing? And a couple of the things that I have done some content analysis on is if, if the party supported immigration cuts, what reasons did they give for doing so? In other words, how did they frame the problem that needs to be solved through uh, reducing immigration? And similarly, if they supported continued immigration, what reasons did they give for doing so? So um, New Zealand first, I, what I did was I studied all of the press releases and speeches that I could find by any political candidates between uh, June 19th and September the 22nd, and I came up with 56 uh, altogether. Um, that is of those that mentioned, specifically mentioned immigration. And then I looked at the reasons they cited for needing to decrease immigration in those speeches. So New Zealand First uh, covered a lot of reasons, including infrastructural pressures, uh, need to protect New Zealand jobs for, for New Zealanders, protect working conditions for New Zealanders, um, housing, uh, pressure on social services, and of course in the case of Winston Peters there was a lot about uh, the gold card and how um, the fact that 
immigrants could bring their parents to New Zealand and most parents would become eligible for the gold card and that was a threat to the viability of the gold card. That was a quite frequent framing in his talks to Grey Power. Um, and he also talked a little bit about the need to protect immigrants and sort of spoke to some of those stories about Indian students, for example, being exploited. So, but interestingly, nothing about concerns about integration. So there was never in any of these speeches any mention of, of anything to do with um, immigrants having values that were somehow incompatible with New Zealand values or concerns about immigrants not settling and all of that kind of thing. That was uh, not in the speeches that I saw. Of course it may have, he may have said things that were not in the uh, press releases and in the speeches that I that found posted. Uh, so Labour, on the other hand, as we know, Andrew Little said early on in the campaign prior to Jacinda Ardern taking over as leader that it was time for a breather on immigration. In terms of their reasons for decreasing immigration, the primary reasons given were infrastructural reasons, uh, particularly roading, um, housing and social services. But um, they didn't talk about jobs, protecting con working conditions for New Zealanders, concerns about integration, or the need to protect immigrants. And so I think this is very much uh, an attempt by Labour to say, to distance themselves from any of the exclusionary kind of language that New Zealand First has a reputation for doing. Um, and also they themselves, of course, will suffer for probably quite a long time for their Chinese sounding names. Um, the framing of the housing issue, was it last year or the year before? Uh, so I think these are things, if you think about them, infrastructure, housing and social services, which are not related to individuals, they're not individuals' jobs, they're not you know, specific uh, threats to individuals, but to infrastructure issues. <laughs> so, just this is just a graph uh, that compares the appeals of New Zealand First and Labour um, and the spectrum of those kinds of appeals. And then just lastly, uh, how have other parties responded to New Zealand First's anti-immigration message? That is, have they used the um, deflect, diffuse, adopt, which of those kinds of strategies oh, have they used? Um, so, this, the, the, the blue columns are diffusing it, that is by trying to talk about it in a way that uses no exclusionary framing and it tries to reframe it as an issue that's nothing to do with anything that could be seen as trying to exclude particular types of migrants. Yellow is calling as this is the reject strategy where it's calling out parties on their particular kind on a an exclusionary framing and interestingly three of the four of the parties were explicitly rejecting of any kind of exclusionary framing of the immigration debate james shaw of course gave that speech where he apologized for having or for the Greens having talked about there being a need for a population policy and he said I realise now that that was read as being blaming immigrants for jobs, infrastructure etc and we want to completely distance ourselves from that, we want to make it clear that immigrants are not responsible for any of those things. So that was a very clear and explicit rejection of any kind of exclusionary framing. Similarly the Māori Party gave a speech in which they really reached out to immigrants and said, look, we understand what it's like to live in a world where there is very exclusionary language. That's not what's going to happen. We're not going to talk about immigrant, immigration in that kind of way. Uh, Peter Dunn similarly did before he left the political frame. And ACT used this um, reject framing as a way of criticising Labour for saying that they uh, thought it was time for a breather on immigration. New Zealand First, we can see here, employed several strategies. Some of it was um, diffusing, in other words, talking about immigration in a way that 
didn't use any kind of exclusionary framing whatsoever. In fact, most of their press releases and speeches did this, but of course they had to be read in the broader framework of New Zealand's first history. And I, ha I haven't done the work yet, but I have coded for the other framing in terms of foreign ownership. And quite often these speeches, the way they talked about, he talked about immigration wasn't exclusionary, but the broader framing of the speech was all about China in particular and its desire to, for example, take over the dairy chain, as he put it, from the field to the baby's mouth in China. Uh, so that, I, I may rethink this next one, dog whistle, because it was a bit difficult to distinguish between something where it's explicitly dog whistle, where in other words, where somebody talks about an issue and then says, but I'm not saying that because I'm racist, um, and the broader framing. So I'm trying to nuance that. This denial category is one that I had to invent specifically for New Zealand First that didn't exist in the, in the international literature. That's because he quite he would attack, for example, when the Greens, when Materia Ture said he was being racist, he had one or two, several actually, speeches and press releases where he attacked them for calling him racist for wanting to reduce immigration. So it's kind of like a, as, as I said, I'm trying to think about these categories. I'm not, I'm not racist, da 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 da, and you're wrong to say I am, da 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 da. Um, but interestingly, I think um, adopt, none of them full on adopted what you would call a, the kind of strategy and the kind of language that we see in um, being used by, for, you know, the classic proponents like Le Pen, et cetera, um, or some of the other European far right parties. Anyway, so that's really where I'm up to with this um, and just what's next. Uh, more analysis of the speeches and press releases for their framing and then looking how that flows into analysis of the media coverage of elections. So have, have the media largely adopted those kinds of frames? Which of those frames do they adopt? And then how that flows into public opinion. So do the public, uh, which are the issues that the public identify as being important? Um, and then that in itself is all part of sort of trying to think about how elections are periods of uh, very calculated listening and um, uh, very competitive storytelling. So which stories were successful and in, in which areas and who, 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 who was listened to really and who was heard during the election campaign in terms of the way that immigration was discussed. So, oh, so this went on a bit, sorry. Anyway, so that's a broad outline of some of the work that we're doing at the moment. Great, wonderful. First digital clap. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual clap, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kate. There was a, a, a fascinating discussion, and I think in particular in the ways in which it engages with the most recent election um, offers us, uh, everyone, I think, a sense of being able to engage with, um, uh, with, with the kinds of key points that you're making and the kinds of questions you're raising there at the end. Um, I'll, you know, so far as people are available, we do have time for, for conversation and, and, and questions to follow this. So um, I'd just like to invite people to, um, to to jump in, stick your hand up, and um, and perhaps we can see if there's someone outside of Auckland um, to start with. Um, uh, rather, I know there's a big crowd here; they might have questions too. Um, but that might be a good way to start. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Jess, I can see you. Uh, good, okay. I wasn't sure if you could see me because I can't see myself now. <laughs> um, thanks, Kate. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation and lots of, yeah, lots of things to think about and obviously all those different components uh, that are part of that. I think I have a comment. Um, and just briefly before I start, that is Trudy from Messi there by now, by any chance? No. Has she joined? No. I don't know how to. No, maybe not. Okay. Um, 
In, ter in terms of the differences uh, in voting behavior between Pacifica and Asian voters broadly, uh, I mean, you've been talking about uh, both origin and uh, favoring the incumbent party and those sorts of factors. I mean, it strikes me that it would be interesting to look at socioeconomic status and maybe uh, visa categories, for example, uh, and perhaps employment status and things like that. Uh, as reasons for differentials in voting behavior amongst those groups. Is there any way of uh, looking at that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the visa status is a really important one. And Fiona and I did try and get that a little bit because, I mean, intuitively, you would think that there would be differences between people who came in on a family category, say, or people who came as students or people who came as entrepreneurial um, business visa uh, immigrants. When we do the quantitative analysis, so long as there is sufficient sample size to work with, um, we would control for all of the socioeconomic factors uh, to, to see whether or not there is any difference uh, that you can identify in immigration, even once taking all of those things into account. Because of course, in terms of the broader voting literature, all of those things like you know employment, income, education, and age are all crucial factors in terms of determining voter um, behaviour. And so what we would need to do is to be able to control for those factors and see whether yeah. once you control for those, yeah, which, which other factors are important. Um, which is something that um, uh, Leon did in his research and also uh, Xi Jong Park and hers, uh, but again, it's it's with relation to the more recent Asian voters. I think that's where some of the work needs to be done now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, Sandy. Hi, Kate. Uh, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, I just wondered with the analysis that you're going to do of media coverage of immigration issues. I'll, uh, Trudy and I have just been doing a media analysis of New Zealand Herald articles on immigration and diversity. Um, but that oh, was sorry, free... I can't hear you. Yeah. Mm. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, so Trudy and I, Trudy Kane and I have been doing a media analysis of New Zealand Herald articles on immigration and ethnic diversity um, in, mm -hmm. in Auckland. Um, so I was wondering what sort of media you're going to cover, cover in your analysis because you've mentioned stuff like the ethnic um, newspapers, which I think would be quite interesting because we've just been focusing on, obviously, the New Zealand Herald, so they probably have a very, maybe a different approach to framing those issues of immigration. Um, so, um, in relation to the ethnic minority media, we're doing the Chinese Herald, um, and so it's going to be quite interesting to see whether or not that is very different to the, whatever you find with the um, New Zealand Herald. Uh, but we're also doing uh, the Home Voice, which is the Wellington Chinese paper, the New Zealand Messenger, which is the Christchurch uh, Chinese paper, um, and Sky Kiwi analysis. But we just did it for the, for the month, no, for six weeks preceding the election. Um, and then we also did it for several Korean papers and an online Korean um, website. In terms of my own analysis of the media coverage, the way I've done that is I've looked at, um, well, I don't know how complete it is, but I've looked for any um, opinion pieces or news reports of immigration during the actual election campaign. Um, so I'm looking at both sort of the proxies for the parties in the left and the right in terms of the opinion pieces that are in various blog posts and that kind of thing, but also the mainstream media's opinion pieces. Um, and really the goal of that particular analysis is to see taking from some of what I just showed you, which of those frames are the frames that are being represented most often and particularly in the opinion pieces. And I, th I think from what I've seen so far is that there's a lot more frames that are employed that aren't necessarily employed by the parties. Like a lot of the opinion pieces, for example, start off by saying things like, we're all immigrants, um, but da 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 um, And so there are frames, I think, that 
influence how New Zealanders are seeing the significance of immigration during the election campaign. So my focus may be different to yours is specifically on its impact on the election itself and the election campaign, the lead up to the, um, the campaign and the debate during that campaign period. It would be interesting to see what you come up with, especially the stuff about ethnic diversity. I'm not looking at that. Yeah, I mean, what we've found um, at the moment is that there's a lot of economic framing, which is probably not surprising. Yeah. Yeah. But that kind of just reduces immigrants to, you know, economic resources. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I thought it was interesting, too, because uh, there was some stuff from Justin Ardern about um, the way that she was talking about immigration, which was quite different to the way that, say, Andrew Little was talking about it. Um, and she was talking about reducing the numbers in order to, um, you know, obviously to supply housing, all that stuff. So then you could offer them or immigrants the New Zealand way of life, um, which was quite different to the, you know, kind of, well, we don't have enough resources and houses and all that stuff. So it seemed to humanise them a little bit more than the yeah. other discourses. Yeah. Yeah, I also noticed, I don't know if you saw this, that there was very little said about immigration after she came after she took over as leader, because prior to that, um, uh, Ian Galloway Lees had had various press releases, etc. But they all stopped at that point, and I didn't find any after that. Yeah. Couple of questions here, Mr. Yeah, I, I can I can start. So. Uh, in uh, most countries, anti-immigration policies of parties are, are associated with uh, right-wing parties. And in New Zealand, we've got an opposite set of configuration. And uh, how would you explain that? In what way is New Zealand different? Is it uh, the fact that migration is framed as skilled migration mostly? And uh, that's uh, my second question, because in, in this uh, election debate about immigration, uh, this dichotomy of skilled versus non-skilled migration featured quite strongly and uh, uh, do you plan any analysis on that because I, I think in who is framed as skilled and who is framed as not skilled uh, it's uh, um, it is not a neutral set of judgment that I have class and gender uh, um, assumptions behind this and uh, do, you, do you see any differences between parties on this skilled non-skilled framing yeah one of the questions I asked or, or I looked at when I did the coding was did the speech or the um, content analysis mention specific immigration categories? And the categories that were mentioned most often by New Zealand First were the, um, he always talked about, well, he always said, they say they're skilled, but they're not skilled, they're very unskilled. And then he would talk about the Indian students and that, that, um, sort of immigration flow as he saw it. So to return to your first question about why is the New Zealand context so different, I think there's several elements to that. And one is, of course, that we're an island and therefore protected from a lot of the kinds of um, irregular flows that uh, make up um, some of the immigrant population in countries. And so when those populations are irregular or described as illegal by political elites, uh, then that changes the discourse. I think New Zealand has also had a very high level of agreement between the major parties about um, the need for skilled migration and, the, and they've had both consensus on the need for migration and um, the ability to actually implement those policies without them being undermined by uh, unplanned forms of migration. So those are two really important factors. The type of migration, the fact that it has primarily been uh, skilled migration, um, or at least migration that's come in through uh, selection by the government uh, to fill job shortages. That whole framing of things makes a real difference. Um, I also think the fact that we have non-citizen voting probably makes a difference because if you live in a country where there are large portions of the population who are, not, who are not enfranchised, and the costs of um, using exclusionary language is much lower. 
than it is in a country where pop, where immigrant populations are likely to become enfranchised pretty quickly because it's only you only have to be here for a year on a non temporary visa in order to be enfranchised and so the risks of using that kind of exclusionary language become much higher um, but so that's partly how it answers your first question and the second question is yes I think that's really important part of the content analysis of the speeches is how uh, migrants themselves are framed by the visa categories that they come in on and which of those categories in this election were seen as being problematic and which were left alone and ignored. Uh, my question relates a little bit to the last one, but it, early on in the talk you mentioned um, whether parties were moving to the right or whether the whole spectrum was moving to the right. And I just wonder whether the right-left framework is, is a useful one or whether maybe it obscures some of the issues, because historically anti-immigration politics can pop up in different ways across the left-right spectrum. Uh, and we you know we sort of saw that this election and you know by bringing that framework you're sort of in you're at risk of redefining left-wing parties as right-wing parties because they take a, a position on immigration so I wonder whether it might just be better just to address it directly and talk about you know open or closed or soft and harder borders rather than a left-right framework that's a really good point um I, I talked about that in relation to the international literature because that's very much how it, it has been framed in the international literature is whether or not um, mainstream right-wing parties are co-opting the language of the far-right parties and that's, that's largely as a result of the fact that in those parties and in, in those party systems in Europe the anti the strongest anti-immigration party tends to sit on the far right of the spectrum and so it's that whole sort of um, act of pulling things closer to, to that part of the spectrum. But I think that is another reason why New Zealand is interesting and possibly different. And that is that you have this party that's anti-immigration, which has historically gone both left and right in terms of forming coalition governments, and that that will make a real difference. And I think that the way that you're talking about it in terms of open and closed borders, or um, I think, Another way of thinking about it is this idea of thinking about exclusionary versus non-exclusionary. Because it seems to me that one of the, and I may be wrong about this, I have to do a lot more of the research, seems that New Zealand is different to the European countries for several of the reasons I mentioned before to Celestina, but also uh, it's very politically um, unacceptable to engage in deeply exclusionary or even slightly exclusionary language. That's not to say that a lot of the, you know, that certainly New Zealand First has done it, but there are, it seems to be the scope in the New Zealand political discussion and in the media for that to be jumped on and identified pretty quickly. Uh, and it's interesting to think about what are the institutional features of the New Zealand political system and the party system that make that uh, potentially different to the way in which it's framed in the European context, which is very left and right. Yeah, I mean, the, the ACT Party is another interesting one, which is sort of open on an economic level, but can be socially quite um, exclusionary in, in its language, or at least David Seymour was. But I, but I guess, yeah, it's just that thing of having that left-right spectrum might cover over some of those subtleties and. Um, some yeah. of the interesting elements where you'd want the sort of the framework maybe to come out of the political reality that you find. Yeah, that's right. And I think I think that's why when you think about New Zealand, it's it, it is a really different political space, and you have to develop your analysis not you know with reference to, but not dependent on and framed by those European experiences, which are not settler societies, for example. They have, you know have a lot of different contextual factors. But thanks, David, that's helpful. <laughs> thanks very much, Kate. That was really interesting. Um, I couldn't help thinking, and this is just a totally uninformed question, but um, how much you, would, might, you might be able to find out about um, a juxtaposition of policies relating to people 
and numbers and these sorts of um, characteristics that we associate with ethnicity and immigration and the other and uh, with um, policies that relate to taxes and um, regulation of capital flows because it, it strikes me that um, it, 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 my immigration policies are always um, raised when uh, when, when in fact, quite often it's the capital, it's the, it's the um, foreign investment capital that, that is freely coming in and out of the country that is affecting the conditions within the country. For instance, I was thinking of your pie charts where you have the housing and the um, infrastructure and those different colored um, sections of uh, how the different parties framed their uh, speeches. And so I just wondered if there's any way that you could be looking at um, uh, references to tax or corp uh, something that that looks at the open capital and the borders to capital do you yeah. in finance do you mean in terms of that that section where I'm looking at the framing the way that the parties are framing it perhaps or just when you come when you go through your the speeches it seems to me that um, you know, it just seems to me that there's a, um, it may be a massive diversionary tactic to um, be talking about people when the voter popu voting population is made up of those people, as well as, um, you know, the new hybrid mixtures of self and other in the same populations, you know, in terms of the cultural imaginary. And yet, one thing that um, average people are being affected by in terms of say housing, social services, infrastructure constraints is actually how much investment is being put into those and, and where those decisions get made uh, may be nothing to do with people and population. So, you know, I wonder if that, that could be an aspect of how you can make sense of some of those speeches. One of the things I did when I was playing around and I hope you appreciate, I haven't had a lot of time yet to do this given the election and the exam period, but one of the things I looked at was sort of a more meta analysis of how they framed it. So national, whenever it spoke about immigration and it didn't advocate in any of the speeches or press releases that I found production. And in fact, during the campaign period, there was that reversal of that, well not reversal, but the increase in the, what was it, the decrease in the um, salary cap that people needed uh, in order to be able to apply for residency. Um, but in any case, they framed these debates as all about openness. So for them, even when they, were, when they weren't specifically talking about immigration, you could just see that immigration would be just one tiny little word in there, but it would be there alongside uh, business and growth. And so growth was their overall kind of arch, you know, overarching idea and that growth was dependent on openness and immigration was part of openness, as was you know maintaining access to the housing market for foreign buyers, etc. And interestingly, the final uh, uh, front page of the local Chinese paper on the day before the election in Wellington was a picture of Bill English launching a Chinese-owned property business, and it was a huge front page thing that went on to another page on page 18. So it was a big story, and it was all. And so the message that seemed to be coming from National there, and we, again, we haven't done that coding yet, but from the two Chinese-speaking coders that I talked to, it was very much framed as, you know, New Zealand's open for business, it's open to Asian business, etc. And so that was National's framing, and it was very much about that. Labour was trying to say, as um, someone said before, that it's about... Um, you know, maintaining standards for Kiwis, uh, or, or, or maintaining standards so that everybody can enjoy a good life in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand first very strongly positioned themselves as being all about the threat to New Zealand from outside. So it was, even though that was never talked about explicitly in relation to immigration, that was the overarching message was that everything is under threat from foreign buyers, foreign purchases, ind independence of New Zealand is being lost. Um, so in that respect, I think that's true. And it goes back to David's question. That's that whole thing about openness and, and engagement with the outside world and where do we sit in that and where do immigrants sit within that broader spectrum. And Labour, I think, 
clinic trying to walk a line between saying yes we're open but we also want to breathe it and therefore we just talk all about infrastructure as being the sort of conduit to that issue and also we're we're um, you know i mean we're on the path to the end of labor as as a as a, a quality of a society in which a society it, workers are guaranteed work and so that it it suits every it suits the parties to start to um frame these discussions in terms of who controls labor you know for for whatever reasons and to keep the kiwi way of life and etc and um ma manages it and monitors it and makes sure that it, we don't get too much of it and uh, and and create and sees labor as a threat but make sure that we have some enough when we have to do a rebuild in canterbury and mm -hmm. who says oh we're open because in fact they've moved on from labor they're not even interested anymore in in, in whether we have enough labor to milk uh, cows on dairy farms and stuff, and et cetera. So, it, you know, I think that there's quite a, um, a, an important, I mean, we're just trying to look at this in the mobilities literature in terms of the, the, the changes to major social structures post-World War II that created shifts in patterns that, that we're now experiencing in terms of their consequences, you know, and it just strikes me that nationals, um, a lot of nationals, the, the party approach of the national party is appealing to people who will bring things into this country for it to grow in certain ways that has nothing to do with the rest of the population that is just trying to get along and make a living and, um, and manage with these decaying infrastructures, etc. So th that when you said the language of threat and cultural threat, I just thought there's quite a lot in there that could really be linked to some historical conditions as well as contemporary risks. So. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you uh, thank you, Kate, for your interesting presentation. So in your presentation, you talked about different ways of framing of immigration by different parties in New Zealand. From what I understood from your presentation was that you were mostly talking about economic immigrants. If I understood correct, uh, so where do you see the place of refugees in terms of that framing? I, I looked at all of the speeches I could find and press releases that mentioned anything to do with immigration or immigrants, including refugees, um, and coded when there was a mention of refugees uh it was i i don't ha i haven't i'm sorry i haven't had time to do that analysis but there were very very few mentions of it in any of the speeches um most of the speeches um were focused as i said on either skilled the need for skills and the other graphs i haven't put up there are national when they talked about how they framed immigration they framed immigration as a hundred percent they talked about economic the economic benefits of immigration so in terms of the parties framing about why we do need immigration we need immigration for economic reasons whether that's rebuild uh, roading um, skills agriculture none of the parties talked about the need for um, or the benefits of immigration in terms of cultural or political uh, terms they all talked about it in terms of economics uh, and i think that again i suspect during an election campaign refugees were just an issue that um, the labor party mentioned that they were going to open up a new category of refugee the climate change refugee and the greens talked about refugees but other than that refugees were pretty much absent from the debate i mean i'm only looking at uh the basically 12 12 weeks prior to the election so the election campaign in many respects you can see as being continuous <laughs> throughout the entire three-year period and some of it happens in the immediate period immediately before the election campaign the official election campaign i might jump in and ask a question kate a lot, a lot, your, your, the focus of your analysis has been very much on about how immigration is being talked about and that makes sense but it, it strikes me and you know we'd all be familiar with this that when we're talking about um, groups that are framed as other, 
um, and in this case immigrants would be one of those things, that actually a big part of understanding how those framings occur is about how the we, I, or us are talked about. And so I'm wondering, wondering to the extent it might actually be useful in addition to, talk, to look at the ways in which New Zealandness is talked about, um, or Kiwi and that phrase being used within uh, debates leading up to elections. So anecdotally, for example, one thing I noticed very, very strikingly when um, Andrew Little stepped down and, and just into, uh, uh, and took up the leadership of the Labor, Labor Party was an avoidance, almost an seemingly intentional avoidance of the use of the word Kiwi. Whereas over the last nine years, every single Labor leader has said Kiwi every second sentence um, in order to connect with their mythical middle white male um, base that they've been trying to reconnect with um, for quite some time. So I mean, uh, I mean, maybe that's just anecdotal, maybe analysis would show that that wasn't the case, but it strikes me that that, that, that points towards the importance of thinking about self and the ways in which framings of self occur around, uh, around immigration, particularly where a lot of the dis discourse around immigration is, as you say, um, more subtle than we might, um, the, than the kind of um, overt kind of language that you see in, say, the European context. Yeah, I I really like that idea, Francis. And that's um, in the abstract that I sent you um, prior to having done a lot of the research. Um, <laughs> I talk about how I'm interested in how we conceive of, or how New Zealanders conceive of the self that goes to the voting poll, like how do we conceive of ourselves as voters? Who, who are we when we go to the polls? Um, and that's, that, I've been thinking about that in relation to non-citizen voters and in relation to, um, you know, the, the idea of who is the political self in New Zealand, when the political self in New Zealand includes people who <clears throat> don't even have permanent residency here. They may be residents, they're not citizens, they may not live in New Zealand. So it's a very broad, uh, inclusive, in legal terms, idea of who the political self is. But then layered on top of that sort of legal definition of who the political self is are, of course, all our cultural understandings who we are. And that's what that, that's where I want to go with this idea of competitive storytelling and calculated listening during an election period because the parties, of course, are engaging in very calculated listening. Uh, you know, what do people think about immigration? Where, where, where are the fault lines? What, what, what can be done to exploit those fault lines or to avoid uh, losing votes as a result of those fault lines? And therefore, what kind of story can we make up or can we shape in order to maximize our vote? And what is that? How does that compare that? So that's sort of where the comparison of the different stories that the parties are constructing comes in. And then when you see that reflected in the stories that come out in the media, including the proxies on either side, um, what what are they saying about who we are and who isn't us? And so I think that's where I'm trying to get to with this idea of looking at exclusionary language mm. and inclusionary language. But the idea of Kiwi is an interesting one. Personally, I've always hated the word Kiwi and I'm not even sure why, and I hate being called a Kiwi. Yeah. I don't really know why either, but I think it's because it makes a whole lot of assumptions that are unspoken and unknown, um, whereas I'm quite happy to be called a New Zealander. Well, I think they're, they're unspoken, but they're certainly known, I think I would say. <laughs> People know, Mike Hosking knows what he's talking about when he says Kiwi. <laughs> Can I just say about Mike Hosking, one of the many things that irritates me about Mike Hosking, but I think it speaks to his arrogance, is that his Mike's minute that he gives is two and a half minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I wanted to follow up on this uh, feeling of belonging because I've been also doing uh, focus groups uh, with migrants here in, in Sweden and my focus was on political participation and uh, uh, like, like you showed in those um, social survey results, the feeling of belonging is uh, yeah. clearly correlated with participation. Uh, but uh, what are your thoughts on what makes uh, people feel they belong? Because uh, 
uh, in, in my Swedish focus groups, the economic integration was uh, a very important part of it. Uh, migrants in Sweden have problems in access to the labor market. And uh, so many people told me, I don't feel like I belong because no one wants to employ me, they don't want me uh, working with them. Uh, whereas uh, in, in New Zealand, migrants are uh, integrated economically quite well. This uh, is, of course, a consequence of the selection on entry. Uh, and, um, uh, and I had people uh, telling me they feel they belong or not, but uh, Actually, I, I wish I had asked them more questions now when I'm looking back at uh, that research. So I wanted to ask you if you have any uh, insights in what in the New Zealand context makes migrants feel they belong or not. Um, in the New Zealand context, I mean, I, I think all of the things that you talk about uh, are going to influence whether people feel they belong, like their ability to get a job, to get housing, so there's sort of all of the socio-economic forms of integration and then you've got political forms of integration and one of the things that came out really strongly from our focus group research was that even those people who hadn't yet started to vote said that the fact that they knew they could vote gave them a really strong sense of being welcome in New Zealand and I think that that speaks to quite a profound um thing is that voting when 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 you give people the vote give people when people have the right to vote they become influential on their fellow citizens lives so we are all all of us who vote influence each other's lives and so i think that in some profound way migrants who feel that they have the right to vote uh see that they are trusted to be part of a political community and trusted to make decisions on behalf of other people. So they become part of a community of, um, uh, of influence, if you like. Uh, and I think that's quite profound. And I did actually look at that in relation to New Zealanders who live in Australia, who tend, according to the statistics, to have slightly higher socioeconomic um, outcomes than even Australian-born Australians, uh, because they tend to be better educated, etc., than than Australians as a whole. Um, but since two thousand and one, uh, those people who've moved to Australia can no longer vote. And so, I asked them, what did that make them feel like in terms of whether they belonged, whether they felt they were valued, whether they felt they made a contribution, and whether they felt optimistic about living in Australia. <coughs> And they said that socioeconomically, they felt like they belonged really strongly, like they, um, they felt accepted by their neighbours, they didn't experience discrimination, but the fact that the government had withdrawn their access to social and political rights gave them this very dissonant feeling of belonging. They felt economically integrated, socially integrated, but nonetheless, the fact that they couldn't participate politically and that they were explicitly ruled out of social rights, access to social rights, made them feel profoundly as if they didn't belong. And a lot of them would say, well, you know, if they don't want me, I don't want them uh, kind of feeling. So it was quite an emotional response to, to that uh, form of political exclusion. And conversely, I think in New Zealand, the opposite of that, this feeling of trust that, that the people are tr people trust them enough to say okay you can participate in making decisions that will affect us which is quite a profound thing to do um i've just been alerted that um this room is booked from 12 30 and somebody is trying to get into this room here um I, so i know we have to disconnect um so i know that others can continue the conversation um kate i just wanted to say thank you uh, as we as we depart um, from things. So please do continue the conversation. I saw a hand go up just a second ago. Um, thanks very much, Kate. See you. Thank, thanks, Francis. And nice to see the rest of you. See you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Aicha, did you want to ask? Yeah, I have a related question. So in your focus groups, you observed higher level of political interest among Asians. So I was wondering why this political interest doesn't translate into uh, uh, turnout 
uh, in other words, what explains the lower uh, turnout of Asian migrants? That's the million dollar question. That was <laughs> what we were trying to find out. Um, and in fact, in our focus groups, a lot of people were politically integrated. Um, and I think the, if we were to go on the data that's available plus our focus groups, I would say that a lot of it is to do with the length of residence mm. uh, in New Zealand and that people may, as time goes on, become more integrated than they are now. Um, the kinds of reasons that Asian people gave for not participating when they were asked um, in previous elections was that they were out of the country on election day, that they were working on election day, um, or that they just didn't get around to it, which are not that dissimilar to the reasons that were given by non-Asian um, and non-immigrants. Mm. But I think w w as long as um, Asians constitute a very large proportion of our more, most recent immigrants, we'll see low electoral turnout amongst those groups. But it's, the international literature shows actually that in the UK and in the United States and in Canada, immigrants from Northeast Asia, like China, for example, have very low turnout rates, whereas immigrants from some other countries like um, India tend to have quite high turnout rates. And that there is some research from the Immigration Longitudinal Study that also has found that, in terms of electoral enrolment anyway, that there's very different, big differences between those from Northeast Asia and those from India. But again, in the New Zealand case, that might have uh, come from the pattern of migration and the recentness of the migration. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I, we, we really don't know enough about it um, at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But it is a concern from a democratic point of mm -hmm. view, because when you have uh, Asians are the most underrepresented ethnic group in terms of um, political representation. The, you know, the proportion of Asian migrants, uh, Asians as politicians is much smaller than their proportion of the population. Mm -hmm. And that can become a declining circle where if Asians are seen as not voting, politicians don't see it as worth their while reaching out to them, then they don't get policies that meet their interests, therefore they don't see it worth voting. So it's like the youth, you know, lack of youth voting. So this can be a unvirtuous circle going on there. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Any other questions before um, we I, close? Yeah, please? I kind of had a question. Um, I don't know what the answer, but I was just thinking about the overwhelming sort of emphasis, particularly with the National Party, like you said, Kate, that focuses on the economic um, you know, priorities or imperative of, of immigrants and immigration. Um, and I guess doing that, the, doing that media analysis from the Zealand Herald, some of the opinion pieces and also some of the comments from um, immigrants that were integrated in some of those articles, um, you could really see that being re-emphasised and reproduced in, in those discourses as well. So the immigrants themselves would be saying stuff like, um, you know, what they can contribute to the economy because they can, they have a different kind of penetra market penetration. But, you know, it's a kind of whole um, productive diversity discourse, you know, around. Yeah what we can offer um, that's different and then we can also connect with China and all that stuff. Um, I, I kind of wonder with that overwhelming economic framing and emphasis, how much that might influence, um, you know, the support for the various political parties. I don't know, I guess it's probably not something you can answer straight away. But Do you mean that it's probably a lot more do you mean that if you are a national voter, you may be someone who's voting in the interests of economic growth, etc., and that if migrants are placed in that frame, that it, that you're more likely to appeal to those voters who for whom that's a primary interest? Is that yeah, I, I guess so. Maybe, well, maybe that's just overly simplistic to say, you know, people only vote for national because of, you know, the economic policy. But yeah, I guess it was a very... No, I, think, I mean, I think that's true. And I think, as I said, it's calculated, you know, all of these messages are highly calculated. Um, and the storytelling <coughs> that goes along with it is highly calculated as well. And so the economic framing is going to be there for a reason. Um, and I think that's Labour's dilemma is that they, they want to, they want to not be seen as anti-growth or yeah. You know, they don't want to be un 
seen as you know trying to close New Zealand off but at the same time they're trying to acknowledge that there are very real stresses on things like housing and infrastructure and um, so maybe that economic framing of the economic benefits of migration makes it even harder for Labour to tell the particular kind of story that it tells. Yeah, because um, it really does normalise um, the importance of you know, economic growth and the economic imperative of immigration. And it kind of silences any other dimension of an immigrant. Yeah. In their life in New Zealand. Yeah. Right, I thought it was just quite interesting. Because yeah, it really and it's... Sorry. No, sorry. Okay. I was just about to say that there, there were a couple of opinion pieces um, in the New Zealand Herald, Her Her which is, it seems to be um, our period of time that we were looking at the New Zealand Herald articles. It was um, 2000, uh, 2016, July, July 2016 to June 2017, so probably just before you did your analysis. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> Goodbye. Um, and there were some opinion pieces that you know, really took issue with the fact that it was, I mean, there was only like one or two, um, really took issue with that over, overwhelming economic framing of immigrants. Um, but despite that, and it was explicit rejection of that, but despite that, a lot of the articles did continue with, you know, when it was the immigration um, changes in immigration policy, it, were, it was a lot of stuff around um, what the industry leaders were saying about its impact on its business and growth, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, it just seems to be what there's recognition that, that that's problematic, that immigrants just seen as economic resources, but it doesn't seem to have taken it, um, doesn't seem to have the power to, to you know, sort of encourage people to see them in a slightly different way. I think it's kind of a um, interesting bind, isn't it? Because I think perhaps one of the reasons why immigration hasn't been a very salient issue in New Zealand in contrast to the way it has been in many other countries, is that um, it has been framed as being good for us economically. Mm. And that's been such a powerful kind of framing of the issue that it's been good for us and we've got economic growth and migrants are part of that economic growth. Mm. Um, that to, um, to try and offer any, uh, it's sort of caught them in that, in that framing and in, in that, you know, it's hard to develop another kind of, Framing and to then um, try and say talk about other parts of it is to be against economic growth, if you like. And so, yeah, I think this is what you were talking uh, what you were talking about. Oh no, um, actually, Martha. Sorry, Martha was talking about in relation to um, Labour. You know, not Labour Party, but as in workers. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that framing becomes very difficult looking after workers and looking after the interests of New Zealand workers becomes a difficult frame to put forward when you are um, caught within that economic understanding of the benefits of migration. I'm sorry, I just realised I have to take my son to the doctor in half an hour <laughs> and I have to go and pick him up from school and get back to Brooklyn. So, um, we won't go over time. What, what's Thank that? Much, Kate, in the absence of a uh... Francis, <laughs> oh, thank you. And the oh, people thanks. are still here for presenting and attending. <laughs> yeah, thanks um, all of you for attending. Yeah, yeah. So just for the ones who are still there, this sort of concludes the launch, I suppose, of this network with the free talks we've had from uh, Alan, Jay, and from you, Kate. And we hope to continue with this next year, maybe starting in February, probably. So we will be in touch and we will be inviting uh, people to present their research. So if you're keen, those who are still around now, do let us know. <laughs> if not, we'll send something around or ideas for speakers and so forth as well. So we're looking forward to continuing those conversations uh, next year. And Kate, um, I've been in touch. So Trudy was actually attending, but we couldn't see or hear her. But oh. she's been in touch with people from the depths of Facebook. Um, <laughs> so we'd love to, uh, once this is finalized, the research that Sandy has been working on, and um, share that with you. That'd be, that'd be wonderful, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks heaps, everyone. <laughs>